Welcome to Fortune Forecast, and I am your hostess, Daisy Raisler. We have been going through the Edinburgh Lectures on Mental Science by Thomas Troward. And wow, when I thought Chapter 5 was deep, Chapter 6 really just had me spinning. We were introduced to the Law of Growth, and we were reminded by the Bible verse from Isaiah 28, verse 16, He who believeth shall not make haste. And when we when that kind of gave me the idea that if you have faith, you know, that again from the Bible is small, or small as a grain of mustard, right? That's all you need. And, and then you don't worry about, oh, I've got to push this and I've got to do that. And, and, you know, that all anxiety and fear that comes in. And that was perfect, perfect timing to introduce that. And just the idea that um, even in the Bible, we are constantly reminded the efficiency of faith and the destructive influence of, uh, of fear and unbelief. So with all that, and just the idea of how we manifest and these truths that are being revealed, I am really excited to guide us into Chapter 7. Again, this book is in the public domain of the United States. And so let's get started on Chapter 7. Receptivity. In order to lay the foundations for practical work, the student must endeavor to get a clear conception of what is meant by the intelligence of undifferentiated spirit. We want to grasp the idea of intelligence apart from individuality, an idea which is rather apt to elude us until we grow accustomed to it. It is the failure to realize this quality of spirit that has given rise to all the theological errors that have brought bit bitterness into the world and has been prominent amongst the causes which have retarded the true development of mankind. To accurately convey this conception in words is perhaps impossible, and to attempt definition is to introduce that very idea of limitation which is our object to avoid. It is a matter of feeling rather than of definition. Yet, some endeavor must be made to indicate the direction in which we must feel for this great truth, if we are to find it. The idea is that of realizing personality without the selfhood which differentiates one individual from another. I am not that other because I am myself. This is the definition of individual selfhood. But it necessarily imparts the idea of limitation, because the recognition of any other individuality at once affirms a point at which our own individuality ceases and the other begins. Now, this mode of recognition cannot be attributed to the universal mind. For it to recognize a point where itself ceased and something else began would be to recognize itself as not universal. Mm-hmm. For the meaning of universality is the including of all things, and therefore, for this intelligence to recognize anything as being outside itself would be a denial of its own being. We may therefore say without hesitation that whatever may be the nature of its intelligence, it must be entirely devoid of the element of self-recognition as an individual personality on any scale whatever. Seen in this light, it is at once clear that the originating, all-pervading spirit is the grand, impersonal principle of life, which gives rise to all the particular manifestations of nature. Its absolute impersonalness in the sense of the entire absence of any consciousness of individual selfhood, is a point on which it is impossible to insist too strongly. The attributing of an impossible individuality to the universal mind is one of the two grand errors which we find sapping the foundations of religion and philosophy 
in all ages. The other consists in rushing to the opposite extreme and denying the quality of personal intelligence to the universal mind. To answer, the answer to this error remains as of old in the simple question. He that made the eye, shall he not see? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? Or to use a popular proverb, you cannot get out of a bag more than there is in it. And consequently, the fact that we ourselves are centers of personal intelligence is proof that the infinite from which these centers are concentrated must be infinite intelligence. And thus, we cannot avoid attributing to it the two factors which constitute personality, namely intelligence and volition. We are therefore brought to the conclusion that this universally diffused essence, which we might think of as a sort of spiritual protoplasm, must possess all the qualities of personality without that conscious recognition of self, which constitutes separate individuality. And since the word personality has become so associated in our ordinary talk with the idea of individuality, it will perhaps be better to coin a new word and speak of the personal personalness of the universal mind as indicating its personal quality apart from individuality. We must realize that this universal spirit permeates all space and all manifested substance, just as physical scientists tell us that the ether does. And whatever it is, there it must carry with it all that it is in its own being. And we shall then see that we are in the midst of an ocean of undifferentiated yet intelligent life. Above, below, and all around, and permeating ourselves, both mentally and corporeally, and all other beings as well. Gradually, as we come to realize the truth of this statement, our eyes will begin to open to its immense significance. It means that all nature is pervaded by an interior personalness, infinite in its potentialities of intelligence, responsiveness, and power of expression, and only waiting to be called into activity by our recognition of it. By the terms of its nature, it can respond to us only as we recognize it. If we are at the intellectual level where we can see nothing but chance governing the world, then this underlying universal mind will present to us nothing but a fortuitous confluence of forces without any intelligible order. If we are sufficiently advanced to see that, such a confluence could only produce a chaos and not a cosmos, then our conceptions expand to the idea of universal law, and we find this to be the nature of the all underlying principle. We have made an immense advance from the realm of mere accident into a world where there are definite principles on which we can calculate with certainty when we know them. But here's the crucial point. The laws of the universe are there, but we are ignorant of them. And only through experience gained by repeated failures can we get any insight into the laws with which we have to deal. How painful each step and how slow the progress. Eons upon eons would not suffice to grasp all the laws of the universe in their totality. Not in the visible world only, but also in the world of the unseen. Each failure to know the true law implies suffering 
arising from our ignorant breach of it. And thus, since nature is infinite, we are met by the paradox that we must in some way contrive to compass the knowledge of the infinite with our individual intelligence. And we must perform a pilgrimage along an unceasing Via Dolorosa beneath the lash of the inexorable law until we find the solution to the problem. But it will be asked, may we not go on until at last we attain the possession of all knowledge? People do not realize what is meant by the infinite, or they would not ask such questions. The infinite is that which is limitless and exhaustless. Imagine the vastest capacity you will, and having filled it with the infinite, what remains of the infinite is just as infinite as before. To the mathematician, this may be put very clearly. Raise x to any power you will, and however vast may be the disparity between it and the lower powers of x, both are equally incommensurate with x to the square. The universal reign of law is a magnificent truth. It is one of the two great pillars of the universe symbolized by the two pillars that stood at the entrance to Solomon's temple. It is Yaquim, but Yaquim must be equilibrated with Boaz. It is an enduring truth which can never be altered. That every infraction of the law of nature nature must carry its punitive consequences with it we can never get beyond the range of cause and effect there is no escaping from the law of punishment except by knowledge if we know a law of nature and work with it we shall find it our unfailing friend ever ready to serve us and never rebuking us for past failures. But if we ignorantly or willfully transgress it, it is our implacable enemy until we again become obedient to it. And therefore the only redemption from perpetual pain and servitude is by a self-expansion which can grasp infinite itself. How is this to be accomplished? By our progress to that kind and degree of intelligence by which we realize the inherent personalness of the divine, all-pervading life, which is at once the law and the substance of all that is. Well said, the Jewish rabbis of old, the law is a person. When we once realize that the universal life and the universal law are one with the universal personalness, then we have established the pillar Boaz as the needed compl complement to Jacquin. And when we find the common point in which these two unite, we have raised the royal arch through which we may triumphantly enter the temple. We must disassociate the universal personalness from every conception of individuality. The universal can never be the individual. That would be a contradiction in terms. But because the universal personalness is the root of all individual personalities, it finds its highest expression in response to those who realize its personal nature. And it is this recognition that solves the seemingly insoluble paradox. The only way to attain that knowledge of the infinite law, which will change the Via Dolorosa into the path of joy, is to embody in ourselves a principle of knowledge commensurate with the infinitude of that which is to be known. And this is accomplished by realizing that infinite, as the law itself, is a universal intelligence 
in the midst of which we float as a living ocean. Intelligence without individual personality, but which, in producing us, concentrates itself into the personal individualities which we are. What should be the relation of such an intelligence towards us? Not one of favoritism, not any more than the law can it respect one person above another, for itself is the root and support for each alike. Not one of refusal to our advances, for without individuality, it can have no personal object of its own to conflict with ours. And since, since it is itself the origin of all an individual intelligence, it cannot be shut off by the inability to understand. By the very term of its being, therefore, this infinite underlying all-producing mind must be ready immediately to respond to all who realize their true relation to it. As the very principle of life itself, it must be infinitely susceptible to feeling and consequently it will reproduce with absolute accuracy whatever conception of itself was we impress upon it. And hence, if we realize the human mind as that stage in evo the evolution of the cosmic order at which an individuality has risen capable of expressing not merely the livingness, but also the personalness of the universal underlying spirit, then we see that its most perfect mode of self-expression must be by ident identifying itself with these individual properties and personalities. The identification is, of course, limited by the measure of the individual intelligence, meaning not merely the intellectual perception of the sequence of cause and effect, but also that indescribable reciprocity of feeling by which we instinctively recognize something in another, making them akin to ourselves. And so it is that when we intelligently realize that the innermost principle of being must be by reason of its universality, have a common nature with our own, then we have solved the paradox of universal knowledge. For we have realized our identity of being with the universal mind, which is commensurate with the universal law. Thus, we arrive at the truth of St. John's statement, You know all things. Only this knowledge is primarily on the spiritual plane. It is not brought out into intellectual statement, whether needed or not, for it is not in itself the specific knowledge of particular facts, but it is the undifferentiated principle of knowledge which may differentiate it in any direction that we choose. This is a philosophical necessity of the case. For though the action of the individual mind consists of in differentiating the universal into particular applications, to differentiate the whole universal would be a contradiction in terms. And so, because we cannot exhaust the infinite, our possession of it must consist in our power to differentiate it as the occasion may require, the only limit being that which we ourselves assign to the manifestation. In this way, then, the recognition of the community of personality between ourselves and the universal undifferentiated spirit, which is the root and substance of all things, solves the question of our release from the iron grasp of an inflexible law not by abrogating the law, which would mean the annihilation of all things, but 
by producing in us an intelligence equal in affinity with the universal law itself and thus enabling us to apprehend and meet the requirements of the law in each particular as it arises. In this way, the cosmic intelligence becomes individualized and the individualized intelligence becomes universalized. The two become one. And in proportion as this unity is realized and acted on, it will be found that the law, which gives rise to all outward conditions, whether of body or of circumstances, becomes more and more clearly understood and can therefore be more freely made of use, so that by steady, intelligent endeavor to unfold upon these lines, we may reach degrees of power to which it is impossible to assign any limits. The student who would understand the rationale of the unfoldment of his own possibilities must make no mistake here. He must realize that the whole process is that of bringing the universal within the grasp of the individual by raising the individual to the level of the universal and not vice versa. It is a mathematical truism that you cannot contract the infinite and that you can expand the individual. And it is precisely on these lines that evolution works. The laws of nature cannot be altered in the least degree. But we can come into such a realization of our own relation to the universal principle of law that underlies them as to be able to press all particular laws, whether of the visible or invisible side of nature, into our service and so find ourselves masters of the situation. This is to be accomplished by knowledge. And the only knowledge which will effect this purpose in all its measureless immensity is the knowledge of the personal element in universal spirit in its reciprocity to our own personality. Our recognition of the spirit must therefore be twofold, as the principle of necessary sequence, order or law, and also as the principle of intelligence responsive to our own recognition of it. And this concludes and ends chapter 7. I don't know. I think I need to take a deep breath. I need to celebrate. This is just wow, wow, wow. My dear one, what what do you think, my friend? Oh, my goodness. It is just mind-blowing. But I um, kind of want to go back a little bit to um, right there in the beginning. He hit us up with one of the, I would call it, uh, actions that we can take, which is, he says here, the idea of setting foundation. Well, imagine, this is just like a builder. You're, you're going to build a house. You need that foundation, a good foundation. So he meant, like for me, I, I kind of wrote down a little note here. I wrote, that foundation comes through good habits. And then I started to think, well, can an old dog learn new tricks? And that's when I said, dang, even that statement is one that, that I would say it's like a, a, a subconscious programming that makes us think, that doesn't matter that, that just because you're a certain age, you can't improve, you can't learn something. So I am erasing that from my little vocabulary because yes, anyone can learn a new trick, even an old dog. I'm a unicorn. Ha, ah, there you go. Anyway, the other thing that I wrote in here was intelligence of undifferentiated spirit is it's a matter of feeling. So we need to embody the feelings. So I, I believe that one of the other things to, to begin to master is understanding our feelings so that we will know what kind of feeling we're trying to evoke in the process of manifesting 
and then getting that nucleus and thought out there and then just you know letting it gestate with the with our um feeling he also uh said something here about when he's i'm going to read the paragraph because i wrote it down here universal spirit permeates all space and all manifest substance so immediately i would say this universal spirit is god god is everywhere and i love it how he describes we are in the midst of a notion of undifferentiated yet intelligent life seriously i don't think i would know how to you know create a tree i <laughs> but it just amazes me or the formations of the clouds every 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 sky is different and i'm standing in the same spot but every day this beautiful universal spirit god whatever you want to call it gives me a new sky and i love the hope of this next set sentence gradually as we begin to see truth our eyes to its immense significance it can only respond to us as we recognize it. Whew. It's just powerful stuff here, my friend. And then the mention again, uh, the, that very nice gentle nudge. Uh, where's that manual? Uh, wait, wait a minute. The laws of the universe are there, but we are ignorant of them. And it's so sad, <laughs> so sad but true. And uh, where he wrote, and only through experiences gained by repeated failures can we get any insight into the laws with which we have to deal. Wow. I love I, I, these last three chapters just have taken me away. And what about the revelation from the book of John, the first book of John, chapter 2, verse 20? And all of ye know the truth. So I looked at the whole, I went and went into my Bible and looked at the whole thing there. It says, the Holy One has given you His Spirit, and all of you know the truth. I, I, so, I mean, do we know the truth? I guess at that subconscious level, but are we, are we uh, recognizing it? I'm so excited to go into chapter 8. Oh my God. Oh, my friends. Um, definitely, uh I'm really excited. I hope you are too. Leave your comments. Tell me what you think of this material. Take a deep breath. Come, let's go to chapter 8. <laughs>